it said that I would be talking about hair a little. Didn't you think Charles I had a rather short haircut? Cromwell went a wee bit too far. <laughs> but there you go. Um, <laughs> you got it. <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to be here. I must say that first. First time asked, and I couldn't have been happier. Thank you. Um, I want to talk about a young boy who, when he was three years old, and we're going back now to the, I was born in 28, so we're going into the Depression period. When he was three years old, my, his, I'm sorry, <laughs> damn it, you blew it. His mother was evicted. Uh, Dad had left home. And it was just my brother, six months old, myself, two and a half. And she really didn't know what to do. My father was a bit of a playboy. He spoke seven languages. And I know he had sex in all seven. <laughs> but, um, because they told me. <laughs> um, mother had to move, we, that was from Shepherd's Bush, to the east end of London, a tenement in Petticoat Lane. And uh, of course we moved with her. And my aunt Katie had a two-roomed tenement with just cold water inside. And if you wanted to go in the middle of night, in the middle of January, you had to rush outside the front door to the end of the corridor. And you hoped somebody had been sitting there before you. It was freezing. Anyway, um, I loved it there. Petticoat Lane in those days was, probably is today, different peoples different cultures, but that's where people came off from the docks to the east end of London. And uh, it was a very exciting, for me, wonderful situation. There was the, the guys with the barrows selling whatever they were selling. And I've turned back into the first person, that's okay. <laughs> and we used to run around, my brother and I, when he was a little older, and just have a marvelous time in the market. Everybody there spoke three languages, English, Yiddish, and rubbish. <laughs> and of course, when I was four, I lost my brother. We were in the lane together and he just got lost. And they found him asleep in a banana box. And a year later, I was taken by my mother to an orphanage. That was when I was five. And I can remember what I said, Mama, no, no, Mama, no. And she had no money. She had no way of keeping us. And my Aunt Kate didn't have the room. Just two rooms, and there were seven in the house. And I found myself for seven years in an orphanage. My brother joined me a year and a half later. That was a happy event. Now, there was one thing about it that I loved. You see, in the tenements, nobody had a bath. They had to go down the street for tuppence to get a bath. The orphanage had a bath, and I was always found in it. <laughs> oh, I loved it. Hot water, and 
a sense of being alone, being free. Water always did that for me, swimming. Water made me feel the freeness that there was. And that ended because September the 1st, 39, Germany invaded Poland. And September the 3rd, 39, of course, Britain and France declared war on Germany. So the following day, all the kids were moved out of London because they thought there might be attacks like there was on Rotterdam and other towns very quickly and destroying just everything. Well, they did later, but not then. And we were moved to the country where there was more cows and sheep than people. Holt, Wiltshire. Holt, near Trowbridge in Wiltshire. Um, it was all right if you were a country lad, but I was a town boy. I was used to the markets, I was used to the smells of the town and the lovely talk of the people and the craziness that there was. And, but I was developing an independence. I was developing because of my experiences, not a nervousness, but an independence. I loved Roosevelt's, there's nothing to fear but fear itself. And I was very lucky, because I didn't fear anything, except somebody's big fist. But it didn't come into my sense of being that you had to be scared out there. No, what came was a lovely feeling even when I was a shampoo boy at 14, and let me see, I've got it here, and I wanted to say it, to say it exactly. In the midst of winter, I finally learned that there was in me an invincible summer, and that was Camus. And I thought Camus was actually marvelous. I was reading Camus from a very young man, and every four or five years I read L'Etranger again, The Stranger, which is a beautiful book. It talks about the loneliness of the individual, how they conquer fear, how they conquer that sense of not being able to be creative, to do, to want. And eventually, looking at hairdressing, I felt there's got to be something to change this. People were being teased, lacquered, and for me it wasn't right. I was looking at the Seagram's building, I was looking at the Whitney, and it wasn't right. And who did I meet? I met two of them, Rem Coolhouse. Rem said to me, I've got your cutting book. It blew me away. I said, why? He says, because it's got shapes and angles in it. And another man I met was, thank you, Marcel Brower. That's my wife, Ronnie. <laughs> Marcel Brower, I went into a restaurant in London when I was uh, going back from the London to New York. And a friend called me over and he said, oh, I'd like you to meet, boom, 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 and Marcel Bro. I said, not the Marcel Bro. And he said, yes. And I said, do you mind if I join you for about a half an hour? They put a chair there for me. I went back to the people I was with and said, I've got to spend this half hour with Marcel Bora, so please order what you like and let me have this half hour. And I went back to Bora, and he was superb because not only did he know architecture, but he knew shapes. He was aware of other people's work, in not just architects, aware of other people's work in what they were doing, whether it's sculpting or whether it was art, or whatever it was. 
And uh, he finished up saying to me, by the way, I know your work. And that kind of gave me that sense and the awareness because obviously I've got to cut a lot of this out. This could be 80 minutes, not 18. But um, we were started to travel all over Europe and the Far East. And the Far East was fabulous for me, especially Japan, where the ideas and the colors and the awareness of newness was there. It was beautiful. And Japan gave to me a sense, a true sense of an open world. Now, an open world to the individual means that you, you, or you can do anything you want. You didn't need professors to tell you, although I think you're very lucky if you're staying at the college for four years and having professorial teachings. I miss that. I wish I'd had it. But there was this sense out there of anything's possible. And you can make the changes. And I was in absolutely intent on changing the hair in Britain, which then spread. We had teachers come to our schools. We have now a school in Shanghai where our young Chinese students are learning all the new methods. And one morning, I was lying in bed and I woke up laughing. I've never done that before. And it suddenly, my life came to me from a shampoo boy at 14 in the East End to an awareness of what was needed. But it was not just Britain, it was international. And people were coming us to learn from different countries. And then we opened academies in different countries. And it all started here, in the East End of London. And the creative excitement that that's given Britain, because at the time, I worked with Mary Quant since 1957. I'll get, I'll get onto this one. Because she came in with her husband, Alexander. And Mary said, I'd love a haircut. I said, fine. No problem. And I did something I'd never done before or since. I nipped her ear. And the blood was pouring down and I was ignoring it. So nothing had happened. And her husband said, you charge extra for that. And then we realized we rocked up and everything. And since 57, we've been working together on different shows. And the extraordinary absolutely extraordinary difference she made because you wouldn't know but this is in the 60s and what a difference she made she changed the way people looked it was very exciting working with her and then of course an opportunity came to go into products and uh, it was fun oh in the first salon client came in, very dark roots, and she wanted to be gray blonde. The colorist, I said, uh, I wouldn't try that if I were you. He said, I think I can make it. And she was, this was nine o'clock in the morning. At 5.30, she looked up, she said, Lawrence, that was his name. I've been here all day and I'm still not gray blonde. He said, Madam, when you see the bill, you will be. <laughs> There was a lot of comedians around in those days. Mother was a wonderfully... See, my mother got me into hairdressing, literally pulled me by the arm and said that she'd had a dream that I was going to be a hairdresser. And uh, I was. Suddenly I was in a salon, 
hairdressing, or well, not hairdressing, shampoo, cleaning the floors, because in those days it was wartime. And cleaning women, forget it. You had to do all that yourself. So we really, from the floor up, we were getting an education. And Mother was an extraordinary character. She lived till 97, 75, gives me a call and says, you're going to Milan tomorrow? I said, yes, Mother. She said, why didn't you invite me? I said, well, because we're working for a week. She said, but I don't need anyone to look after me. I can see Milan. Anyway, she talked herself into it. <laughs> fell down the stairs on the first day, marble stairs. All those hotels in Milan had marble stairs. And broke it, broke a leg. Oh, how am I going to manage this? So I had to run to the hospital and then do our work. And I said, Mother, um, there was a crucifix on the wall at the back. And I said, Mother, does that offend you at all? And she said, no, he was a nice Jewish boy. <laughs> the, end of the, the end of the week, we went to take her out. And we got one leg, a cast from here to here. But there was one leg that we got over the side of the bed. I was helping the nuns. It was a, a Catholic hospital, and the nuns were, well, Italy. And the nuns were looking after her. Beautifully, I may add. And as we tried to get the other leg over, she went, oh, oh, oh. I said, what's wrong, mother? Am I hurting you? She said, no, darling. It's been such a long time since I've had my legs this far apart. <laughs> that was my mother. I won't get more risque than that. But, uh, <laughs> but the craft itself has been wonderful for me. And to be an influence in this craft, which hundreds of thousands, who knows, worldwide, more than a million or more people are working in it. To be an influence <laughs> has, it says one up there, does that mean one minute. Oh. To be an influence <laughs> has been a great joy. I've loved it. Absolutely loved it. And at 83, I hope to go on loving it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.